Hi everyone. We'll just give it a couple of minutes to allow people to come into the chat, into the session. As you're coming in, if you want to introduce yourself in the comments section, please do. That'd be really useful to see who's on, who's involved. Be great. Just have another minute just to make sure that everyone's able to join. As I say, as you're coming in, please do introduce yourself in the chat. It'd be great to see who's there. Another 20 seconds or so. There's still a few people coming in, just give it 10 seconds or so. As you're coming in, welcome everyone. Um, please do put your name into the chat and introduce yourselves. It'd be great to see who else is on. Right, I think, I think we can get started now. Yeah. Perfect. So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Domestic Customary Law and Ocean Governance, an introduction to different perspectives and approaches session. My name is David Wilson. I am a lecturer in maritime history at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow and a co-investigator on One Ocean Hub. I'm very excited and privileged to be with you today to chair and participate in this fantastic session. I am very thankful to UN Dualos for the opportunity to coordinate this event for colleagues on the UN Nippon Fellow Programme. And thank you to everyone who's attending today or who is watching later on. We have seven short presentations for this session, each around five minutes or so each, and covering diverse perspectives of domestic customary law within an ocean governance context. Our speakers include One Ocean Hub researchers and Nippon Fellow alumni, and include perspectives covering Fiji, Indonesia, the Caribbean, South Africa, and Ghana. After the presentations, there will be some reflections on the presentations as a whole before moving on to a Q&A discussion session. As I said, please do introduce yourself in the chat and add any comments within here as the presentations progress. However, please make sure that any questions are raised using the Q&A function below rather than the chat. We will do our best to answer these questions either through written replies or during the Q&A session itself. Although apologies in advance if we don't quite get to your question. We won't be able to keep an eye on questions in the chat itself, so again, please do use the Q&A function. It's the best way to ask a question. To begin, yeah, so to begin, my own perspective here draws predominantly from how customary law has been framed and constructed within areas that experienced European colonisation and where Indigenous peoples continue to come up against the legacies and ongoing structures of European colonisation. When Europeans arrived in Indigenous spaces, they held certain common but not homogenous European conceptions of marine space, which were further developed and entrenched by colonial expansion. There are two general aspects of this, which I am simplifying for the sake of time. Jurisdiction over the high seas and jurisdiction over territorial seas. According to European doctrine, the high seas could not be owned or possessed it was viewed as the common property of all mankind, which meant free and open navigation within the high seas was a natural right for all individuals. And marine resources within the high seas 
were part of a maritime commons. There were also European assertions that a territorial style sovereignty could be extended from land to territorial seas. This could be considered a space under the exclusive jurisdiction of the sovereign power who controlled the nearby shores. An included jurisdiction over the resources and commerce occurring within this space. The distances to which this sovereignty extended was not definitive or agreed until the 20th century. When Europeans projected these imperfect conceptions of maritime jurisdiction into indigenous marine spaces, they conflicted with pre-existing indigenous and coastal marine jurisdictions. In certain regions, this included claims to marine space and resources as personal, collective, spiritual, or loaned property. Prevalent claims that limited jurisdiction over territorial seas could be extended from land meant that colonial powers, especially from the 19th century, began to gradually dominate regional ocean governance. While the increasing hegemony of European maritime power was utilised alongside claims of free navigation and a maritime commons to force trade with or regulate the marine activities of indigenous peoples. The rights of indigenous powers to the same forms of sovereignty over territorial seas and jurisdiction over the maritime activities of their own subjects was increasingly denied. The assimilation of indigenous peoples as subjects of colonial states also led to the assimilation of indigenous law within an overarching colonial dominated legal order. To do so, colonizers constructed and repurposed existing indigenous customs or invented customs in attempts to advance colonial jurisdiction, jurisdictional oversight or to make indigenous customs fit neatly within a colonial framework. Indigenous peoples and authorities were not passive in this encounter, but adapted pre-existing customs and rights in response to the extension of colonial territorial and marine control. This was a means to protect or advance specific interests over space and peoples. Indigenous authorities also invented customs in order to do so, meeting colonial conceptions and expectations of colonial, of customary law, in order to gain some recognition of their authority and rights. This could be utilised to best maintain forms of pre-existing Indigenous jurisdiction, but it's also important to recognise that this could also be a means to entrench certain forms of Indigenous authority and Indigenous law over others. This has created a number of prevailing issues. First is that Indigenous and colonial law cannot be disentangled to get to a pure Indigenous or pure colonial law, both informed and adapted to each other. And so there are unique hybridised systems of law in any one region that have been inherently, inherently shaped as a result of the colonial encounter and therefore cannot be easily deconstructed from that encounter. We can, however, recognise the inequalities, power imbalances and ideologies entrenched within existing state and interstate structures that continue to impact on the meaningful recognition of and engagement with the customary laws that manage coastal and marine space and resources at a local level. Second is that customary law, even where it is recognised, continues to sit within a hierarchical legal framework in which it is not the dominant legal system. This creates a situation where customary law is beholden to national governmental frameworks that dictate the extent of customary law's jurisdictional authority and recognition, rather than being ultimately beholden to the peoples who practice or are regulated through customary law. This has also elevated, elevated certain constructed forms of Indigenous authority over others. Where customary law is not recognised as official law, its authority on the ground and at sea is suppressed or neglected within the dominant legal order, leading to a greater disconnect between law on the books and law on the ground. 
Thirdly, to meet the expectations for recognition, customary law was often frozen on the books, and so attempts to shift and transform customary law within existing legal orders to recognise the dynamic and fluid nature of customary law face an uphill struggle within systems that have characterised customary law as part of a static cultural right based on ahistorical ideals of preservation or tradition rather than jurisdictional sovereignty. This means that there needs to be a deep understanding of how maritime activity and ocean governance has been shaped on the ground through colonisation and through the dispossession, dispossession and recognition of indigenous peoples marine jurisdiction. This was a highly localised process and needs to be examined across different scales in order to understand how certain ideas and values surrounding ocean space and ocean governance have become entrenched within local and national systems over time and how this has impacted on the recognition and development of customary laws of the coast and sea throughout different locales and regions. Thank you. Next up, we have a pre-recorded presentation from Joy Tijna Jit, focusing on customary law in Fiji. So let me just stop sharing here and I will share that video. Excellent. Hopefully you can all see this. Hello everybody and welcome to my short presentation on Customary Domestic Law in Fiji. My name is Jyotish Najid and I am the Program Leader with the Cooperative Research Centre for Contamination Assessment and Remediation of the Environment, based in Adelaide, Australia. To give you a little bit of background as context, Fiji has a large indigenous population and historically strong traditional institutions and customary laws. So the indigenous beliefs include interconnectedness of land and sea areas, and they have always believed in the limited nature of natural resources. This has been ingrained in traditional cultures in the indigenous Fijians. There have been failures of fisheries and environmental legislation in terms of conservation and management, and these are well known for small island developing states like Fiji. There are technical and financial deficits, and the partial traditional lifestyles make it a little difficult to follow on some of the enforcement and compliance requirements. Community-based approaches have been relatively more successful and these are guided by customary law and traditional practices. Customary fishing rights and traditional marine tanner are going to be the focus of my presentation and these underpin the success of customary conservation and management in Fiji. So first up, we'll talk about marine tenor. Marine tenor is very different to land ownership in Fiji. In land ownership, Fijian ownership of land is according to Fijian custom. Land was held by traditional owners on a communal stewardship basis. And this incorporated a complex system of ownership of coastal waters and adjacent fishing grounds known as ngolingoli. This communal stewardship was informed by traditional ecological knowledge. However, unlike the land, Crown in Fiji has title to foreshore and seabed of coastal waters. So while land ownership is mostly Fijian ownership according to Fijian customs, the foreshore areas and seabed of coastal waters are under Crown control. Now, even though uh, foreshore and seabed areas are under Crown control, indigenous groups with customary rights to the Ngolingoli are recognized. So their fishing rights are indigenous. The indigenous fishing rights are recognized in Fiji. Together with marine tenor, fishing rights help with the success of the locally, man marine, locally managed marine areas network system in Fiji. Local communities develop marine management plans for project sites. And Fiji is the birthplace for locally managed marine areas network. This has also spread to Samoa and Vanuatu and other Pacific Island countries. Now this network or the LMMA network system focuses on raising awareness, building capacity, sustainable livelihoods, interaction with the Fijian Great Council of Chiefs 
and international interactions with other LMMA network members. The local community implements, monitors, and enforces the plan through village-based management communities. Some of the tools under the LMMA program include harvesting re restrictions and or behavioral controls. For example, no-take areas that might be occasionally opened up for sociocultural needs, complete prohibition on resource extraction in some areas where there's a permanent closure, uh, restrictions on species, that can be caught, gear restrictions, time bans, um, and these may be temporal and spatial. So in Fiji, they are impl implemented via taboos. Taboos are a customary legal mechanism to ban fishing in a certain area for a specific species. So ta taboos, for example, if there is a death of a chief in the village, then the villagers will observe a period of mourning in which there is no, it's not allowed to go out and fish. So that's sort of some of the indigenous use of taboo areas. There are a number of challenges um, to not having customary laws recognized. There's a pluralist nature of law, so the customary laws are not the dominant legal system. The, there is a lack of political will to advance the position of pluralist law. And the constitution provides that the parliament must make provisions for the application of customary laws and dispute recognition according to Fijian processes and with regard to the customs, traditions, usages, values, and aspirations of Fijian people. So I've taken material from a number of different references and I urge you to look at these if you'd like to find out more. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you to Joy Tishner there for the pre-recorded presentation. Next up we have Desi Politi Despriani from the Indonesian Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. Over to you. Thank you, moderator, and thank you, One Ocean Hub, for the invitation to the speaker. Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy from the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries of Indonesia. Today, I would like to present about the recognition and protection of masyarakat hukum adat marine and fisheries sector. In this presentation, I use the term customary community to refer MHA, which focuses on marine and fisheries sector that has customary law, local wisdom, and marine conservation system. According to Indonesian law of management of coastal zone and small islands, customary community is a group of peoples who traditionally settles in Indonesia and has ties to ancestral origins or strong relationship with land, territories, and natural resources. Besides, it engages with customary governmental institutions and customary legal arrangements in their territories in accordance with the statutory regulations. The recognition is important ensure that those traditional practices of customary community are protected by the law. Some challenges among others are setting aside certain areas for the customary community within marine special planning, increasing the sovereignty of the customary community organizations to maintain and manage their territories with adequate infrastructure, as well as improving the skills and capacity of the customary community. This slide describes recognition of customary community and customary law within Indonesia constitutional law and some regulations in marine and fishery sector as long as the customary practices are still striving. And this map shows the existence of the customary community throughout Indonesia. It is made by AMAN or Indigenous Peoples Alliance of the Archipelago Organization. The Ministry, Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries of Indonesia has provided profiles and maps of customary community in coastal areas as a base for the establishment of local government regulations. So far, there are 30 communities as identified as customary communities. However, 
only 27 communities in 15 regencies which have legally acknowledged as customary community. This region regulations give the protection for customary community to manage coastal and marine resources based on local wisdom and customary law. Besides, the law also performs a synergistic direction for economic and cultural empowerment in those areas. This is a case study of the management of marine resources based on local wisdom in the customary territory of Kaprotan village in Palau Island, North Sulawesi. It has been recognized and protected by region regulation. The customary law, which is called EHA, is an implementation of the Manee ceremonial tradition. EHA itself is a warning not to do anything on land or at sea. In the Manee, traditional ceremony is generally conducted once a year on the, on the Intata Island, nearby the neighboring Republic of the Philippines. Visitors can watch and participate in the ceremony by catching fish using a coconut catching pool, namely young coconut leaves tied to a rope and then scattered at the fishing locations. There are some conclusions. Until now, there is still no specific institution pertaining to the customary community and its regulation comprehensively, so that the national law on recognition and protection of customary community is, is urgently needed. And the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries continues to assist the local government in the recognition and protection of customary community in coastal areas of Indonesia. And lastly, but not least, in order to accelerate the, rec accelerate the recognition and protection of the rights of customary community, it is a synergistic collaboration among stakeholders, such as government, NGOs, community, etc. Thank you very much, and back to you. Thank you very much, Desi. Next up, we have Alana Lancaster from the University of the West Indies at Cave Hill, Barbados. Take away, Alana. Thank you, David. Uh, let's find my presentation. Are you seeing my presentation? Perfect. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening all. Uh, I'm Alana Lancaster. Uh, I'm a lecturer in, in international environmental and energy law uh, at the University of West Indies uh, Cave Hill campus. And I also am a COI on the One Ocean Hub project. Uh, uh, today, I will give a, a brief introduction into customary law of the CARICOM and OECS Caribbean. I, I, I narrowed it down to this, these two regional groupings to make it more manageable. Now, uh, the region has a complex history of indigenous people, colonization, slavery, indenture, and migration. Uh, and the members of the CARICOM and OECS are generally island and coastal states, which would have been settled, mainly settled post 1492. Now, colonization and subsequent settlement would have influenced the legal systems, which are predominantly English, uh, but we also have countries, uh, Guyana and St. Lucia, which have hybrid legal systems of Roman Dutch and French respectively and uh, Suriname and Haiti are also members of uh, the of these union of the CARICOM union and they have French and Dutch civil code. Now most of the indigenous persons or the original inhabitants of the Caribbean region no longer inhabit the region and are actually found in very specific pockets um, in across the region in, in Belize, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Dominica, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Guyana, Suriname, and to a lesser extent, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, in addition to the original indigenous or Amerindians as, as they are called, I, I, in this presentation, I also draw attention to three uh, important groups who were, were not originally from the region, but 
are, are considered indigenous in many in many senses. Because, uh, and these would be the Garifuna. So the Garifuna are essentially uh, descendants of 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 well uh, of West African slaves that uh, that are and Caribs, and these the these uh what they would have fled into the, the interior of 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 the islands as would have the bush negroes of of suriname and the maroons of jamaica so in many respects they retain most most of their original uh cultures uh now most of the customary law in the region has been subverted by english law but uh there are examples where we can see uh, customary law either emerging either explicitly, and I will discuss the case of of, of Cal uh, shortly. Implicitly, I, I argue implicitly in the form of statutes which uh, codifies, for example, resource management. So recent uh, recent fisheries legislation, such as the 2013 fisheries regulations of Antigua and Barbuda recognize many species management practices that would have been practiced by the indigenous persons for many uh, centuries. There's also the incorporation into the, the amendment of, by, of the Guyana constitution of the ICCPR and the ICSCR. And this, uh, this is a potential uh, ex uh, uh, avenue for the expansion of rights. Another example is the expression of local custom in the international recognition of uh, the Bekwe, the, 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 the Garifuna and, and Caribs on Bekwe in, in, in the traditional practice of whaling. Now, uh, custom can emerge in, in many aspects, and I've listed some here, but I, I'll, I'll focus mainly on, on numbers uh, five and six. Uh, so the C, uh, how marine spaces are, are, are governed or managed, uh, the fisheries and the use of, of species. So for example, there, there, there can be many um, clashes between so the indigenous conception of, and use of species. Uh, and, and when, for example, legislation which bans the harvesting of, of certain species is implemented and, and, and their fines and so on. Uh, their cultural and spiritual practices are uh, generally the default position of many, of many, um, in many states in the region is, would be to ban or limit or regulate these practices. Now, one of the, the avenues for uh, recognition of, 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 of customary law is through the constitution uh, or and legislation. And I, I give some examples there in Guyana. Uh, it, it's in the preamble as well as, as our, uh, the constitutional amendment that incorporates the international law treaties as well as a specific provision uh, indicating that uh, relating to indigenous persons. Now I want to focus on Belize because the, the case I will look at, the, the case study I will look at is the Cal cases coming from Belize and whether the, the recognition of, of, of indigenous land uh, tenure rights can be extended to the marine environment. Now Belize is in Central America and it's, it's coastal, but it also ha has uh, uh, most of the Mayans, for example, would live in the, also in the interior. Now there are three ethnic Mayan groups, uh, and the Maya would be the original inhabitants, and then you would have the Garifuna. So these are the Garifuna from, they would have come from, they would have been uh, egg, deported from St. Vincent and the Grenadines by the British to Isla de Rotan of the coast of Honduras, of, of Honduras. and then uh, uh, because of, 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 um, of I, I suppose there was unsettled, they fled to Brazil, to Belize in 1832. Now, Mayan peoples account for 11% of the population and the Cal cases originate 
in the decision by the government in 1994 to convert a large area of land into first a national park and then to grant oil and logging concessions. Now, the procedural history of these cases is long, but I, I, it, I'll summarize it briefly by saying there's no indigenous, specific indigenous legislation on indigenous rights in Belize. And therefore, the, the, the case was framed uh, in around fundamental rights and freedoms, specifically the right to property. Now, the, the obvious uh, position of the government was that property has a very specific meaning in English uh, law. And the Maya would have argued that uh, their conception of property is not only collective uh, land rights, but to not only the land they occupy, but to land adjacent. Uh, there were subsequent uh, Supreme Court and Court of Appeal decisions, and the perspective of the Maya were, were, was confirmed by the Inter-American Commission, who indicated that even if these rights were not recognized at the national level, they were certainly recognized at the regional and international level. Uh, the government and the Mayan leaders would have come to what was called the 10 points agreement. However, there was basically an action under the agreement and subsequently uh, the Maya would have then uh, approached the court. Uh, uh, it, it would have gone to the Supreme Court the, uh, the uh, Court of Appeal and the Maya is eventually appealed to the Caribbean Court of Justice, which is the, uh, one of the, the region's indigenous courts, uh, indigenous in the sense of it, it's of the region, not indigenous people, <laughs> sorry. And the government of Belize cross appeal. Now, essentially the, the Caribbean Court of Justice reviewed and uh, the evidence and rely they actually went in they actually went into Belize and a lot of the communities and they found that the there does exist uh the establishment of indigenous indigenous property rights now uh the, the this of course as i said is in relation to the, a, a huge area of, of forest. So the, the, I suppose the overarching question is, do, do these, uh, can these potential, can this judgment have implication for ocean governance and the, the management of, 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 of marine resources in the region? I would conclude by saying that custom is a rare source of law, custom of itself as a rare source of law in the CAR, CARICOM and OECS region, but to quote, one of, 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 of my colleagues and, and, and Car Caribbean academic um, Rosemary Bella and Twang, its infrequency should in no way diminish its importance to the legal landscape. Uh, I, I have pointed out that, it, that there's, there are expressions either explicitly or implicitly in the form of the Cal case or in, 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 in cooperation and in, in, in legislation or the constitution. And in my opinion, the linking of the human rights approach to managing the marine environment is the most feasible avenue to foster the recognition of lost customs. I will end by say, uh, by a quote I, I found in a Papua New Guinea case, the customs of our people are capable of meeting modern developments. And I think certainly for ocean governance and the marine environment, the principles enshrined in, 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 in customary law are axiomatic to sustainable ocean governance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alana. Excellent. Um, and as Bola and I have said basically at the exact same time in the chat, please do put any questions into the Q&A function that are arising from these presentations. Great. Uh, next up, we have Palili Mbata from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Over to you, Palili. Okay, thanks, David. Let me just share my screen. Okay, hello, everyone. My name is Palili Mbata, and I'm from the Environmental and Geographical Science Department at the University of Cape Town. And um, I'm not really a, a lawyer, but I've become very interested in issues of customary law 
and customary and customary governance of resources because I work a lot with uh, governance issues when it comes to marine and coastal resources. So customary uh, practices is something that I've seen a lot in my work and something that I was more exposed to in the work that I did when I was doing my PhD, which I'll touch on a little, a little bit in my presentation. But just, just to give you a little bit of a background, in South Africa, customary law is quite relevant to areas that are unknown as rural. And rural areas in South Africa are mostly areas that are under communal land where there's a chief who is the custodian of the land. And it's also recognized in the country's constitution. So both statutory law and customary laws in South Africa are independent, but they are equal under the constitution. So this means that statutory law can, is not above customary law and vice versa. Although in many cases, especially when it comes to the governance of natural resources, we see that statutory law tends to be more dominant because um, a, a lot of governments, uh, 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 actors, and well, as well as scientists that are usually influential in the governance of uh, resources tend to focus more on statutory law. And customary law is something that is still very much ignored in South Africa, even though there is Incre increasing evidence that certain communities still rely on it to manage resources. And during colonial times um, and during the apartheid era in South Africa, customary law was weakened by laws that transferred certain powers to traditional authorities. And this is purely because um, in the, during colonial times in South Africa, especially in the 19th century, uh, colonial uh, authorities who wanted to work in uh, in, in rural areas, uh, in most times where they, they, they were customary leaders, in some cases they would appoint uh, traditional authorities. So much so that a lot of traditional authorities that we see now, which are systems that are, um, are, are, are controlled by chiefs and, and headmen, not all of them are bona fide customary leaders. So what happened during these two regimes, those governments sometimes um, appointed or deposed uh, custom, uh, customary leaders and they would sometimes also try to define uh, traditional authorities as customary even though they were not always. So customary leaders or customary entities uh, in rural areas can be made up of a variety of forms of structures. So sometimes it's mostly elders within the community or groups within the communities that are sort of uh, appointed by community members. And those groups are not necessarily the same thing as traditional authorities that are chiefs or, 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 or headmen. So, so by intensifying the chief systems in, in the colonial and apartheid areas, customary entities actually lost a lot of powers that they had in terms of influencing governance processes. There are, however, examples where uh, customary authorities or entities are still playing a significant role in the governance of resources. And one of such areas is the one that I will talk about, which is Kosi Bay. Even though the customary leaders there don't have a lot of recognitions from traditional authorities and from the state in terms of decision-making processes. So, um, oh, okay, I, let me just start here just to give you a bit of context. So this is the situation as it looks right now in Kosi Bay. So you, you might, some of you might ask yourself, why, what is the difference between customary and traditional? This is a question that I get a lot. And this is only something that I also discovered in my own work, that actually traditional authorities are usually conflated with customary authorities. And they sound like the same thing really, but in practice, they are not necessarily the same thing. So if I take the example of Kosi Bay, Kosi Bay is an area, which I'll show you now, which, is a, which has a, a, a fish trap system that existed since pre-colonial times. And this system is managed by a, a customary entity within the community that upholds the rules and, and, and regulations regarding what practices should happen uh, with regards to fishing in, in the fish traps. However, this entity is not necessarily the same as the traditional authorities. Traditional authority in the area consists of a chief and headman that is recognized by the state. And this is something that is not unique to the um, democratic dispensation. It was also the same during the apartheid 
er era that ended in 1994 and even during colonial times where traditional authorities were the ones that were recognized by the state. So customary um, structures don't have a lot of recognition in formal or statutory uh, processes, especially ones uh, relevant to the governance of resources. So now I'm just gonna go back a little bit. So as I've said earlier, there is increasing evidence that customary institutions are playing a very big role in terms of um, uh, governing uh, resources in areas such as Kosi Bay, for example. So these, uh, the difference also between customary structures is that they are more downwardly accountable to wider communities. They are more present because they are people that live in the communities as opposed to traditional authorities that are usually more centralized in the area and national governments as well, which the communities don't really have access to. So Kosi Bay exists within this area, which is a world heritage site. So this, uh, the two maps basically show the different layers of governance that we find here. It's a, it's a UNESCO world heritage site, but at a national level, it's also a marine protected area on the coastal side and on the terrestrial side, there's a, a nature reserve. So there are many different conservation layers that are managed using state law. So there's also this uh, idea by the state or scientists that communities don't really care about conservation. So much so that in this area, the customary institutions were not included in decision making about the delineation of the World Heritage Sites and also in the management of the marine protected area and the nature reserve. So they basically operate with the community. But when I engage with them, they, they said to me, that they actually do care about conservation because over the years they've worked on the fishing uh, fish traps fish traps structure that they used to fish which i'll show you just now they've modified it over the years when they thought that it was no longer as sustainable as it used to be so if i can just go to those images now and i can just show you so this is what the fish traps used to look like historically as i said this is a system that is pre-colonial even though the government has tried to uh, sort of challenge the system saying it's not sustainable, local people must just follow the rules of the state. The people have managed to actually uh, fight back the government and continue with this practice. But this is what the fish trap used to look like. It used to have this basket-like design and the fishers over time realized that this uh, design was now starting to capture a smaller fish, which they felt was not sustainable. So as a result, they modified it. And this is what the fish traps look like now. So it's no longer a basket design, but it's more of a, a rounded structure where individual reefs are actually constructed into the lakes and into the estuary. So the picture at the bottom shows you what the, 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 what the series of fish traps would look like in the estuary of the lake. And each line of traps belong to a family in the community. So there's a customary set of rules and principles that exist to manage this whole system. And the government likely hasn't been managed to, hasn't managed to uh, sort of uh, do away with the system, even though they've tried. But the community has kept the system intact. And they've also modified as well the channels between the traps over time when they, they felt that it, it, it wasn't as sustainable. So people do feel that this is a sustainable system and it's sustainable in customary terms, not in Western science terms. And the, the, the difficulty here is that the, the customary structures that are managing, the customary structure that is managing this fish trap is really struggling in terms of uh, gaining influence, especially when it comes to the World Heritage Sites decision-making processes, as well as the MPA and um, Nature Reserve uh, decision-making processes. So the, and also the government usually only acknowledges the traditional authorities, which are the chiefs as community leaders without recognizing that the traditional authorities are not involved in the system. The, the customary institution is a very different system to the traditional authorities. And the chief in this area lives in the nearest town and is not necessarily involved. And it, it does not really know much about what is happening within the system and how it's important for the livelihoods of people. So, 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 so um, this issue of legal pluralism in this area is quite rough. So legal pluralism usually exists between the state and customary institutions in a lot of literature, that's how they define it. But in this uh, situation, you have competition between 
state rules and traditional authority rules and also customary institution rules. So, so it's, 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 it, it creates more conflicts and more um, contestation on the ground. And even if you, if you remove the state out of the equ equation, there is uh, a dispute between traditional and customary institutions about who the bona fide leaders are in this area. So the, the people that are involved in the fish trap system who are seen as customary leaders have a certain understanding about the customary leadership of the area and its history, which sort of uh, goes against the current system of traditional authorities. So this is a timeline that I constructed during my research, which I won't really have enough time to explain in this presentation, but it's just to give you an idea of how complex uh, legal pluralism can be when you have uh, sort of this conflation between traditional and classroom institutions that's at play. And then when you add statutory institutions on top of that, the whole picture becomes even more complicated. So I will end my presentation here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paula, that's great. Um, next up we have Godwin Zah from the University of British Columbia in Canada. Take it away. Right. <coughs> well, thank you, David, and um, <coughs> welcome to my presentation. So my name is Godwin Zah and I'm a PhD candidate at the Allah School of Law in the University of British Columbia in Canada. And I'll be presenting on some insights from Ghana on the topic. So just to walk you through the background um, um, for the um, presentation, we'll go through a couple of um, um, quick basic issues and then we'll go into the constitutional basis for customer law. We'll look at the ocean uses and customer belief systems and how they sort of intersect. And then we'll look at the <coughs> domestic customer law and contemporary ocean governance and then we'll conclude. So just to sort of give a quick um, context to where we are coming from. Um, before colonialism, um, African societies were organized in their own ways, according to their own laws, um, what we now sort of call customary law. And we'll come to why it's called customary law. Um, but these were laws that people abided by in those communities. So in Ghana, and specifically in modern day Ghana, uh, the Portuguese were the first Europeans to arrive sometime in around 1417. And then in between that period till 1876, um, there were different European states that came in back and forth and exercised control over the coastal areas until sometime in the late 1800s when the British established their um, full control. And one of the principal laws at the time, the Gold Coast Supreme Court Ordinance, uh, made the common law, that is the English law, the applicable law in Ghana or in the Gold Coast as it, as it then was. And then subsequently, you would see in that particular law, a provision on customary law. And it's important to sort of take note of this section 19 of, the, um, of this old law and to see how it sort of manifests itself even in our contemporary discourse. So it says that uh, such law or custom not being repugnant to natural justice, equity, and good conscience, not incompatible either or directly or by necessary implication with any enactment of the colonial legislature. This law precisely puts customary law under the, the European or the British law that was received, you know, forcefully into, um, the, into Ghana. So just about this point in time in the late 1800s, what we now generally call the so, social legal displacement of customary law, that is the jettisoning of the um, traditional laws that those societies were governed by, was as a result of the introduction of Europeanized law into Africa. And this is not just peculiar to Ghana, but cuts across almost every African country. Um, so what happens here, and for our understanding, is that a test was instituted under the section 19 that I pointed out earlier. And it says that if a customary norm has to become law, it has to go through three, a three-state test. Equity, but it does not stand against equity, good conscience, and natural justice. And in these particular instances, there were all tests that were tests according to English common law. So 
the idea of equity, good conscience, and natural justice were not ideas that were prevailing in those communities, but they were ideas that were imported from the English law and imposed on those communities. So if a customary norm, as they would call it, does not pass this test, it couldn't become part of customary law. Now, in today's constitution, that's Ghana's current 1992 constitution, what we saw earlier on in the section 19 law, uh, the section 19 of the old <coughs> British law, is exactly what has sort of been modified and incorporated into the current constitutional dispensation. So you'd find that the same language is used where the common law of Ghana shall comprise the rules of law generally known as the common law, the rules generally known as the doctrines of equity and the rules of customary law, including those determined by the superior court of judicature. So you would find that when we talk about customary law in Ghana, it basically is what the courts say it is in principle. If it doesn't pass that test, then it doesn't become part of the, the way the courts or the society treated it. Not necessarily that that does not exist in the society, but in terms of its juridical import, it had to go through this test before it became part of the body of laws in the country. Now, just a little segue into our main focus. We, we know that fishing is the most important economic uh, activity along Ghana's coast, um, mainly artisanal fishing or small scale fishing. But fishing wasn't only an economic aspect of um, life, it was also integral to cultural life. So you'd find that there are a lot of belief systems that are sort of merged into this idea of fishing as a cultural, um, as a cultural component of social life. So you would find the dominant characterization of the sea in particular as a god or a goddess, depending on where you are in the community. And these ideas, these values, these cultural um, inclinations are fused into what has become a social relationship with the sea. So the sea was seen as part of the society in the same way as people or human beings were part of the society. And of course, based on these beliefs and cultural systems, taboos emerged, and these taboos were defined by um, a number of factors, but primarily about four, I would just restrict myself to. That's the interdependence between humans and nature. Um, also the taboos were sort of a bridge between nature and culture. And then they were also a reminder of a measured use of nature's endowment so that we do not use uh, natural resources without um, <clears throat> due consent for their capacity to regenerate. And also the question of human cooperation. So you'd find that there were some taboos, particularly in the fishing communities, where there were in most communities, there's no fishing on Tuesdays or there are closed seasons where you cannot fish. And these ideas, even though they may be taboo systems, were also you know, of value in terms of sustainable development, if you look at it in today's context. Now, we know that in the past, social controls and sanctions for sea use were the preserve of traditional authorities. So if you broke the Tuesday rule or you broke the closed season um, fishing rule, you are subject to the punishment that the traditional authorities may um, <clears throat> impose on you. And these ideas were infused into customary laws so that they reflected the community's conscience and community's um, morality. And unfortunately, if we look at how colonialism came in with the force that it came with, these customary ideas and customary laws have sort of gone through some colonial legal modification. And so you'd find that in where there's a breach of those customary um, laws now, those taboo systems that I spoke about earlier, it's quite difficult for the traditional authorities to sort of impose penalties because there's this interaction between state law and customary law. So it's a, um, when we look at the way um, the law of the sea is operationalized today through the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, Ghana was one of the earliest countries to ratify in some time in June 1983, just a year after the, um, the convention was adopted. And, but today, having operated all these international um, regimes and their, com their domestic components, there's a gradual return to um, neglected histories and ideas that shaped our social construction of the sea. So more or less, you're going back to those abandoned concepts to 
reconstruct our relationship with the sea. And Ghana is not particularly an exception. And you'd find that the discussion around these new ideas uh, largely depend on what is becoming a very um, hot topic around the world, um, the attachment of rights to, to, nat to, to nature, natural resources or to nature. So we have rights of the sea, rights of trees, uh, rights of rivers, and now there's a whole new idea about attaching rights to um, the sea. But as I pointed out earlier on, in the traditional belief systems, the sea already enjoyed legal subjecthood. For example, in Ghana, the sea has names depending on which particular community you came from. The sea was gendered, so it had an identity of its own. So when we talk about the social reconstruction of the sea, it's not particularly unique to these um, traditional societies where the sea was already a form of um, social life, had its form of social life with the people themselves. So we are beginning to also see that these particular changes in the way law interacts with the community and the community's values and the customary laws is beginning to feature in how statutory law and such state agencies are responding to this whole return to customary knowledge for regulation of the ocean use. So one of the recent um, uh, developments we see in Ghana is that the, the state's Environmental Protection Agency is beginning to see greater wisdom in partnering um, elder conservationists, um, local fishermen, and the import of this collaboration is to sort of merge customer observances with, with um, formal rules so that we could modernize the way district level policy on the relationship between human beings and the sea should be guided by. And this is beginning to see some form of um, overall um, social and legal re-engineering in particular in relationship with the ocean use. Um, what is probably the issue that we are stuck with is that there's, um, there's a whole project now called the customary law ascertainment project, which is to sort of identify customary laws particular to societies or communities in Ghana and sort of codify them. The challenge is that for those who are scholars of customary law, practitioners of customary law, it brings about a little bit of concern as to whether codifying these rules will still or stultify the evolution of customary norms into the future. That's a bigger and ongoing discussion that we will not be able to take in, 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 in this few minutes that we have. So I'll end my um, presentation here and welcome questions and comments. Thank you. So thank you, Gordon. And last up, we have Bolanle Eranosho from the University of Cape Coast. Over to you, Bola. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Bola Irino Sho. I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of Law at the University of Cape Coast, which is in Ghana. Um, for the last few minutes of this talk, I will briefly be adding a further layer onto what Godwin has so kindly spoken to us about. So my particular focus really is just to give you a quick outline of the work the One Ocean Hub is currently doing in Ghana around uh, customary law on the oceans. And uh, luckily, because Godwin has given you a very uh, good background to go on, um, I have very little to do. I'm just going to be focusing on you know, uh, what the work is and really what we're hoping to find out. Uh, just a brief background before we start. Now, when we talk about oceans law in Ghana, we're primarily talking about perhaps three classes of laws. Uh, we're talking about the international laws, which Ghana is the signatory to. Um, Godwin mentioned UNCLOS, which is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which Ghana has signed up to. Uh, there are quite numerous other treaties and agreements which Ghana is a party to, the Convention on Biodiversity, uh, 
um, the conventions around climate change, MAPOL, etc. Now, it's important to note here that we haven't particularly put this in a hierarchical framework. So this is not to suggest that international law is higher than national law in the context of Ghana. And in fact, because Ghana favors a dualist approach, a, a dualist ideology for international law, um, there isn't, um, it is not a hierarchical uh, framework. Rather, these are two spheres of laws which operate separately. And so what that means is for Ghana, before those international obligations, which section 75 of our constitution says the president has the power to sign. So the president will go out and sign um, treaties and agreements. But before those treaties and agreements can have any further effect in the domestic legal system of Ghana, there must be an added uh, layer of domestication. And in this case, there must be approval by parliament. And if need be, depending on what kind of agreement it is, there has to be either back in legislation or regulations to implement it. Now, there are significant challenges with that at the moment. Um, not to go into too much detail, but suffice to say that that domestication process has not often gone as well as it should go. And so you would often have many international obligations which have not been translated into national law. Now, at the other end of the, uh, at the other end of the, um, at the next end is what we call national law, which is the, the core of our legal framework. So we've got various acts which have been passed by parliament, regulations, and all sorts of other subsidiary legislation, which parliament has passed. Here, the constitution in section 11 talks about customary law as one of those sources in addition to common law as well as legislation. And we'll come back to that in a bit. And finally, in the other category are what we call bylaws, which are adopted by local district councils, metropolitan assemblies, so local laws, which often essentially uh, translate national law at the local level. And separate from that is what I, in quotes, call unofficial or living laws, which are the customs, the norms, the traditions, uh, which local communities live by, and some of them have perhaps arguably force of law within those communities. And they perhaps are unofficial because they haven't yet been recognized by the state, or they operate outside the sphere of the formal structure of state law. Now, the framework as it is in Ghana is a centralized model based on a top-down approach. So much of the law is lawmaking is done at the national level and then diffuses down to all of the various areas. Now, much, most of the laws are indeed fragmented, they are sectoral, and they often exclude the voices of communities closest to it. And as you would expect in a centralized system, much of the lawmaking is done at the capital level, parliament, etc., and many of the local communities do not get a say in that. Now, this leads us to one big challenge which we have found with ocean laws uh, in specific, but also with many environmental laws. There are significant challenges in ensuring implementation and enforcement of those laws. As you would expect with a system which relies on a centralized command and control scheme, you need um, significant amount of resources in order to get, in order for it to be effective. And those resources, whether financial or bureaucratic, are not as widely available as you would hope they will be. And so it leads to a situation where there is uh, gaps in implementation, gaps in enforcement, and this will often sometimes create conflicts within communities, amongst communities. Uh, for example, with regards to 
illegal fishing gears, uh, conflicts will often arise if communities feel that the laws are not being fairly implemented across board. Now, we, as um, Godwin has said, customary law in the context of our constitution means the rules of law which by custom are applicable to particular communities in Ghana. And the core of that is the acceptance of a custom as obligatory is what confers a normative quality on the custom, which makes it uh, perhaps have the value of law. And because customs are largely flexible, they, are, they were in the past on written. Some of them are now written uh, because we have got court decisions, uh, judicial decisions, etc., which have potentially uh, started to document some of these customs. There are textbooks and writings which are also doing that, but there is still a core of it which is unwritten and it lends itself to flexibility. It is quite fluid and informal, even though previous attempts have been made to try to um, freeze it in time, but on the whole, it is quite flexible. It is quite fluid and informal. And because it is what emerges from what people do or from what people believe that they ought to do rather than from what you know legal specialists like us who have perhaps been trained in uh, uh, the English way or the English system of law expect it to be then we are within the one nation hub I mean therefore testing the assumption that perhaps this can't be a valid or, or use, usable method of ensuring implementation and enforcement. So essentially we're saying that would it perhaps benefit us to have implementation and enforcement of laws which follow the customary laws of people because they are clearer for them, they, they are more familiar with them and it's perhaps more acceptable to them than remote or mysterious state law. And as Godwin has pointed out, this has um, there are a number of projects at the moment which have seen uh, the value in that and are attempting to do that. And so what we are trying to do as well, similar to existing projects, but um, in specific areas within the One Ocean Hub is to document some of these customary laws, the customs, the traditions of people in select communities across four regions of Ghana. Uh, we're choosing the Fantis who have a long history of um, um, relationships with both colonial powers and they're quite close to the sea. We're choosing the Gaz, the Ngamaz and the Adangbes as some of the ethnic groups we will be looking at. And we're going to be exploring the connections between community law, which we use advisedly in this point, customs and values of those communities and the existing national law. Uh, Godwin mentioned, for example, the idea of uh, traditional rest days, uh, which also is a power, the national legal framework um, vests in the minister. So the minister has the power to declare closed seasons and those closed seasons in the last two or so years, which the minister has attempted to um, to vest that power, to um, use that power, has been quite problematic and caused uh, political um, political issues. And it was quite problematic to do that. And yet, the communities are quite happy to follow their own traditional rest days every Tuesday. And so it's all of those kinds of dynamics we're seeking to explore. And we're hoping that by creating those linkages, making those connections, we will potentially find a way to improve enforcement, uh, which is quite severely restricted at the moment. And it would also help us to interrogate what we mean by participatory and inclusive ocean governance in the context of Ghana. Um, as we, and what we mean when we say we're letting indigenous communities uh, deal with this. And so in conclusion, this is a very short 
presentation on a very detailed project. But I would just like to say that we recognize that any attempt to talk about customary law can be quite problematic, actually. Um, there are questions as to ascertainment of customary law, which has been alluded to in a few of the presentations. There are distortions by colonial history, which David so kindly mentioned. And there are also conflicts with human rights and constitutional provisions. However, as it has been shown from some of the other countries, there is value in exploring customary laws for ocean communities in Ghana. And so over the next two or so years, we would be looking to explore some of those issues and we hope to come out with interesting findings. And we're open for questions, we're open for comments uh, that would enrich our research and enrich our work. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Bola. Excellent. So we'll now head over to our um, reflections session, which is um, provided by Jacqueline Espinilla from the Department of Justice of the Philippines and the University of the Philippines College of Law, and Senya Fabrica from the University of Strathclyde. Um, during the reflection session, please do add in any questions into the Q&A box. I know there's a couple there, so we'll, we'll get to those. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. Um, hello, everybody. Um, as David mentioned, my name is Jacqueline Espinilla. I'm a professor at the University of the Philippines College of Law. I teach public international law and ASEAN law with a focus on the law of the sea. Um, currently, I'm also a senior researcher at the UP Institute for Maritime Affairs and the Law of, sea, of the Sea. So I'm very, very privileged to share this space with my colleagues and to be given the opportunity opportunity to share some of my thoughts. So all thanks to Ocean Hub for this um, wonderful um, opportunity. Um, so a number of consistent themes were running through all the presentations. Uh, first, customary laws and traditions relating to ocean uses and spaces have been sort of sidelined for a really long time following the advent of colonial influences. I emphasize sidelined and not banished because they never really went away though they really existed mostly in the rural margins as we've heard from all the speakers. But the resilience of customary law should be explored and we have to ask why. Um, it was noted that in Ghana, for example, laws often exclude voices of communities most affected by legislation. And then the, um, many of the speakers also noted that there are per persistent enforcement challenges. It tells us two things. One, there's something um, wrong or missing in the current legal paradigm. And two, there is a gap that could be filled, that, that still needs to be filled. Um, the presentations evoke, uh, sorry, provoked some thoughts on the possible role and influences of customary law. The identification of customary communities who are given the lead role in resource management, for one thing, is I, I consider a success story. And also how locally managed marine areas and other community-based approaches to fisheries are being done in Fiji. South Africa's customary governance of resources is also quite notable. These success stories demonstrate to us that the incorporation of customs help increasing community buy-in to laws and regulations. This in turn could help ensure better enforcement. The challenge remains in how to facilitate such incorporation. Countries like Ghana, Indonesia, and South Africa make formal provisions for customary laws, allowing for their explicit recognition. This is not necessarily the case elsewhere, making incorporation a bit more difficult. As in the Caribbean experience, it may be possible to look beyond constitutions and utilize case law, which I thought was very, very interesting. The idea of linking customary law to human rights concerns is particularly useful as it, bring, it, as it brings a degree of universality to what people might think is a very niche and irrelevant area. So in that sense, you get more interest in this, um, in, in this topic which in turn could facilitate the political will that will allow it to be incorporated into the mainstream. I'm also intrigued by this idea of treating the oceans as an entity with legal rights, which is something which is a very much a concept in customary law. This is something actually similar exists in the Philippines, which is why it resonated very much with me. Um, in our country, we now have this writ of nature, um, which could be used to invoke to protect the oceans. It was very rooted in traditional um, ideas of how we approach the oceans. So this is something that could certainly be explored elsewhere, and we should build on that in order to help identify and define the rights and, and obligations which we could be accorded to the oceans. Of course, challenges remain, and the speakers have touched upon this matter. There is a persistent lack of political will in sort of bringing to light these um, customs and traditions and in infusing that with um, the modern legal framework. 
And second, there is this notion that, there, that these customs still need to be cataloged and identified in order for them to be treated in a more organized manner and, for, I mean, and make it more suitable for incorporation. And finally, how to, trans to, how to resolve conflict and contradiction, if those may exist, between existing legal frameworks that we have and any, any, and any other customary ideas that we wish to incorporate later on. So I think that's it for me. Um, and I congratulate all the speakers for wonderful presentations. Thank you so much, Shaklin. That's brilliant. Um, Sanya, would you like to offer some reflections as well? Yes. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Sanya Fabrica. I'm the Knowledge Exchange Associate uh, of the One Ocean Hub. Um, I'm also a UNICORN alumni. So from the presentations today, there are three parallel points that I would like to focus on. The first one is the legacy of colonialism, how that creates a hybrid law system where the customary law and customary entities function alongside the common law. Although unfortunately in recent days, the customary law is not the dominant law, despite constitutions make some allowance in most countries. And second parallel point underscore the importance of indigenous peoples and local community as source of traditional knowledge and practices. The traditional belief that see the interconnection between land and sea that we see in Fiji, in Indonesia, Caribbean, and Africa offer knowledge for sustainable use of marine resources and also for conservation. And the third parallel point is there is some movement in various parts of the world, as we see in Indonesia, as we see in Ghana, to return to what known as traditional wisdom as customary law. This is what Godwin say in his presentation as a gradual return to neglected histories for management of the ocean and what Alana pointed out as the re-emergence of indigenous concept of ownership um, in the context of land tenures, particularly the application of this principle, the indigenous property rights in marine environment is something not widely studied and the consultations with indigenous or traditional user about customary management practices unfortunately is not something is, is something that's rarely done so drawing from all these presentations delivered today i believe the way forward is to encourage meaningful participations of indigenous and also local communities in the management of marine space thank you Excellent, thank you so much, Senya. Excellent. So I will now turn over to the Q&A, which we've got a couple of questions in here. And if anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to put it into the Q&A. We've got about 10 minutes or so, but if we need to run on a wee bit, if the participants are okay with running on a little bit, then we can do so. Um, first up, there was a question in the chat from Luciana, who said, question to all, could you comment on the procedure standards and steps to incorporate customary law. What are your findings in this regard? So I guess how is customary law incorporated? What procedures needs to take place to do that or has taken place? What are your findings with this? Does anyone like to kick us off with that? I'll back on you. Um. Okay, um, I'll give it a try. Um, so the question is asking what procedures will uh, allow us to call something customary law, call a custom customary law. Is that, if I get yes. that right? I guess the color custom law incorporate, incorporate it. Well. Yes, how, how to, um, I think my answer would be it depends on what part of the world we're talking about. Although there are commonalities across um, various, you know, um, former colonies, but essentially um, the English approach, as Godwin uh, rightly stated, was to first say that you've got to be able to prove that that custom or customary law in question was in existence at some point or, you know, at the point in question. In the past, there was a cutoff date. Um, now, in modern times, um, we have jettisoned the idea of a cutoff date. Uh, so you must first show that the custom in question is in existence. Then you've got to show that it has got that normative character. So it's the difference between the custom and customary law really is that 
mental element that the idea that people follow it not just because it's a nice thing to do but because they it, it's backed by um sanctions so you know failure to follow it you may be sanctioned uh, so a, a practical example would be um it might be the custom to always wash our hands before we eat in our you know local community so if you go visit an elder you may have to wash your hands before you eat with them that's a custom if you fail to do that you might be frowned upon but no one's going to behead you for that but if it's something which the community frowns against significantly and you may you know you may have some kind of um, um, trial and I use trial in quotes here and you may punishment may be meted out to you then we would say that perhaps it has that mental element which makes it go from ordinary custom to actual customary law now as to how the courts would approach it so once it has been proven that you know that custom is in existence then the challenge we have at the moment is the idea of using you know repugnancy test and saying it does it uh, conflict against other kinds of you know arguably english norms in our own case and if it doesn't then perhaps we can permit that custom to stand now that has implications for us because of the colonial history and the fact that it, it brings into question uh, the idea of superiority of English laws but it is in practice it is still what goes on and so even though the judges might not use the terms repugnant etc uh, you only need to look at the court cases to see that they will often still uh, strike down customs or customary law which they think is against uh, human rights or uh, natural justice which are some of their favorite words or incompatible with modern day living which is another one some of the judges have used and so that those are some of the ways in which uh, customary law evolves if I have answered the question. Thank you Paula, yeah, that, was, that was brilliant, I think, brilliant answer. Um, would anyone else like to come in on that question at all? That's, I mean, that's Paula. Paula covered it for all of us. Perfect. So we've got another couple of questions in the Q&A box here. Uh, Palili, there was a couple of questions for you um, about elaborating again on the distinction between traditional and customary authorities or institutions and its relationship between ocean governance. So would you be able to elaborate on that a little bit further with regards to ocean governance? Then I wondered if anyone else wanted to come in with any examples of that idea of tradition versus custom that Palili covered so well in the presentation, whether that exists in the context that you've looked at as well. Over to you, Palili. Oh, sorry, I got cut a little bit. I just got back now, David. There was a problem with my connection. Can Sorry, you repeat what you said? Yeah, so it's, um, there's been a couple of uh, questions uh, to you just asking about elaborating on the distinction between traditional and customary authorities oh, okay. with regards to ocean governance. Yes. I just provided a long explanation to uh, on, on the Q&A, but just, yeah, I can speak to it here as well. So this is something that can be quite confusing. And it's also something that I picked up when I was doing my PhD, that in fact, in the South African context, especially when it comes to uh, the governance of uh, resources on the coast, that where you have areas that have traditional authorities, the issue of legal pluralism was more complicated there. So for example, in uh, Kosi Bay, the area that I spoke about, and another area known as Desatrebe, where one of my colleagues, uh, Jackie Sane, has worked, and what we found was that there, there were customary systems that predated colonial times that have existed, that have been used by communities to manage access and use of coastal resources. However, when colonial governments came in, wherever they thought that they couldn't work with, um, with uh, the customary leaders for whatever reason, the colonial uh, governments could depose uh, leaders and appoint new chiefs as they felt uh, they needed during the time and this is something and then traditional authorities became 
with the entities that were created at the time that became upwardly accountable to the state. And traditional authorities have remained upwardly accountable to the state uh, over time, even now in the uh, democratic dispensation. It's not in all areas. There are areas where traditional authorities are customary, but one of the objectives of the colonial government was to make all traditional authorities customary, even where they were not. And this resulted in bona fide customary structures in certain areas being undermined and the chiefs basically being the ones that uh, gained uh, acknowledgement from the state. So nowadays, when you're talking about customary law or customary institutions, even under state, the constitution or even under statutory law, most people think about traditional authorities. But when you go to the ground and you go into these communities, people know the distinction that, no, that's the traditional authority and those are the customary leaders. So these are two separate entities. But uh, traditional authorities enjoy now the status of being recognized as both customary, but at the same time, they are recognized by the state. So there are state laws that give uh, powers to traditional authorities. And they can also gain powers from customary law when it suits them. Whereas bona fide customary structures don't enjoy any of that power. They are usually marginalized and they usually have to negotiate um, the, what they are doing basically with traditional authorities. So sometimes even at local level, when uh, they, they, they don't really have a say in terms of what happens when, when they meet with traditional authorities. And usually state actors like conservation authorities, when they are drafting policies and regulations, they normally only engage with traditional authorities and they don't recognize that actually, in sometimes traditional authorities are not the ones that know the customary practices of communities. There are actually customary systems that exist for that, but that are usually not included in decision-making processes. So there is evidence of that here in South Africa. So, so that's where I felt in my own research that it's important to draw this distinction because the more we keep thinking of traditional authorities as customary, it can sometimes be problematic where traditional authorities don't represent the needs of wider communities, but customary structures are the ones that are downly accountable and represents the needs of wider communities, but are usually ignored and overlooked yeah, at all levels. Thank you, Palila, that's great. And it really links into what Bola discussed about the idea of going through the tests of law and what becomes incorporated into, into law as, I guess, customary law within the Guinean context, but what we guess would be tradition within the South African context, which may not be connected to what's actually occurring on the ground. It's a really important point. Um, does anyone else have any other examples or kind of engagement with this idea of the difference between tradition and custom? as of traditional authorities within the regions that you examine and work in that are kind of set aside from custom on the ground at all? That's fine. Uh, we can go to another question. <laughs> so we've got a, new, a couple of questions in the Q&A as well. Um, Jacqueline, there's a question for you here that asks, um, where does the writ of nature portray in various traditional and customary systems as alluded to by previous speakers in the Ghana case, particularly? All right, thank you for that question. So the writ of nature is a modern legal tool in the Philippines that is based on traditional ideas of vesting legal rights on elements of nature. So I brought this up because um, Godwin mentioned that in Ghana, the ocean was given legal personhood. So in other words, it's, uh, the ocean is a rights bearer, a, a rooted in a, the traditional, traditional approaches to the ocean. This approach I think is very wise. And the fact that it is once again being incorporated into legal systems um, shows that there is merit to it into giving um, giving these notions of um, legality of, of, um, of rights bearing um, a place in the modern legal system in the Philippines we use the writ of, of nature to speak on behalf of say the oceans I, I mean since um, that's the context that we're using it uh, for the moment um, in order to protect it, its rights 
it's interesting because it changes the rules on standing. So here we have a, a, an, an instance where traditional concepts sort of um, found a niche in um, 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 modern legal practice. And I think these are the sorts of borrowings that we should have more of and we should see more of um, as um, customary law begins to play more largely in the legal conversation. Um, um, David, if you don't mind, I saw I see another question for me in the in the um, Q and A box. I, I'll address it since I'm here anyway. Um, with respect to how we could resolve potential conflict between customary law and um, state law, I think I, I would like to uh, refer to something which I thought was very interesting that um, um, Dizzy said in her presentation. It's very important to have stakeholder consultation, and um, I agree wholeheartedly with what with what she said. The root really of conflict is exclusion. And that's why we're here, where we are right now, because we sort of cut out customary law from the legal conversation. Um, lawmaking must be a process of, con of uh, uh, lawmaking must be a process or rather a conversation. And it's in this kind of conversation that we sort of learn and we have that process of borrowing in a more organic fashion. It's not about forcing something that isn't really um, taking off um, down everybody's throats. It has to be um, organic for it to sort of really take root and have that kind of buy-in that we wanted in the first place. So um, I think in that way, we could avoid conflict. And should conflict happen, even in the process of, settle, of, of, um, of dispute settlement, we should also consider how a traditional approach to it might be more useful, at least for purposes of avoiding any sort of hostility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Um, does anyone else want to come in on that point about state versus customary law and how that relationship can work in practice? And how we go about kind of better incorporating customary law within, with regards to sitting in alignment with state law? Um, I'll just add a couple of uh, quick things. And I think I agree with Jacqueline. Um, there is, I think political will is perhaps a very big um, or an important component here. You must have political will within the states to be able to, to uh, resolve some of this conflict. Um, I mean, in certain countries, in Ghana, for example, um, post-independence, the, the first thing was the priority of the government was decolonizing the legal system. And so there was arguably an effort made towards trying to resolve some of these conflicts and um, integrate customary law um, properly within the legal framework. Now I say arguably because that hasn't been as successful as you would hope. And so it comes back, I think, to a question of political. We, we need that political push which will then diffuse to all the other sectors. I mean, um, even the inclusion of those lo local communities is reliant on political will of the governments. And um, which I would say that's the advantage that perhaps human rights brings to the discourse because uh, human rights are well established now within many of those legal systems. And those obligations, which often will recognize the rights of, you know, indigenous people, the rights of communities, etc., can be uh, a way to compel or to encourage political will from state functionaries. Thank you so much, Paula. That's great. Um, would anyone else like to come in on that point at all? Cool. So we've got a couple of questions here in the Q&A box. Um, I know it's three minutes past, but we can keep going for another couple of minutes or so, if that's okay with everyone. Yeah, perfect. So we've got one question here from Anas, who says, I have a basic question on what is the differences between Indigenous peoples, local community, traditional community, and customary community? Are those terms uh, referring to the same communities or groups? If not, what is the difference? And who actually practices the customary law? Which groups? Which might seem like a basic question, but it's a really complex and important question. Um, would anyone like to kick us off? Uh, so certainly in, uh, in the Caribbean region, uh, the difference between, I suppose, indigenous and, and traditional, I, I would say traditional is, 
can to some extent encompass um, indigenous communities uh, or indigenous practices, but it also includes practices of the uh, of of persons who would have come after the indigenous people because of of of, color, of colonize, colonization. Uh, generally, uh, and this has certainly been the approach in in Guyana and and uh, Dominica and and Belize, it, the, the the recognition of indigenous rights is 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 a separate category. I I think also. I should point out in, 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 in the Caribbean region, there's also a bit of unease, maybe unease is, 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 is the uh, polite term, I suppose, for it. Uh, and this unease, so, you know, there's friction between the English legal system and custom, but there's also unease between uh, in indigenous groups and they can be unease between indigenous groups and, and the general current population of the state. So uh, a quick example is in, in, the, in the Belize scenario when uh, the, uh, the Mayas would have filed this case, there was a huge uh, anti-Mayan uh, settlement, se sentiment, sorry, uh, because it, it, you know, the, the and, and I think it's, it stems from if you recognize indigenous rights, then it kind it kind of places uh, the potential rights of other subsequent uh, uh, persons to the territory in in or there's a perception that it, it can place these rights uh, in, in jeopardy. And I think uh, this a lot of this comes back to. Uh, uh, communication and, and the political will, uh, because sometimes this is fueled by um, the political directorate uh, for many reasons. And also recognition and respect of, 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 of the groups and, and, and the, the potential of, of the, you know, the contribution of, 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 of to, to, to the legal system and so on. Thank you, Alana. Would anyone else like to come in on that? The problem of definition and across context. Um, um, just a quick word as well. So I think um, with indigenous peoples, well, from my perspective or from my meaning, I think it perhaps replaced, it refers to areas where there has been, where there are perhaps you know, uh, there has been displacement. So um, areas where you have communities who have come in, and I use the word communities, I mean populations who have come in and displaced the uh, original, if you can use the word original, you know, communities who are existing there. So um, we wouldn't tend to use indigenous in our context in Ghana because we haven't got that history of perhaps, uh, you know, um, invading forces or occupying forces coming in and, um, you know, pushing people out of their original land. Um, so that is not that's why we don't tend to use the word indigenous because to me that you know sort of that's perhaps uh more suited to you know places like maybe australia where you've got the aborigines and you know those kinds of contexts and so we don't tend to use uh, um, indigenous peoples uh local community traditional community i think they're just variants of perhaps the same um kind of approach to me i think they just you know it's a matter of maybe style or uh, context uh, so i don't see that much difference between you know referring to them as local communities or traditional communities the only thing is they don't perhaps evoke that feeling of displacement which the idea of indigenous peoples uh uh, evokes and as to the question of who practices customary law, uh, that is a very good question, and that perhaps is one of the main or problematic things about customary law, 
because strictly speaking, everyone practices customary law in one form or the other. And so it, it comes to the question of defining customary law. It's, it can be quite problematic to define customary law. Um, I, I like this quote which uh, Professor Arlott, which is he's one of the old time uh, legal anthropologists, and he said something quite funny. He said, customary law is a bit like an elephant, you know, it's very difficult to describe it, but everyone knows when they see an elephant that they have seen an elephant. And so it is a bit like that. Um, almost everyone practices customary law in one way or the other but um, perhaps for people who have moved away from so in our context people who have moved away from uh, you know their traditional roots they are more inclined to maybe English law and so it's not as relevant to them as perhaps people who live in the villages and you know rural areas so um, there is no straightforward answer, I would say, you know, everyone practices customary law in one form or the other. Excellent, thank you, Paula. I think that might be a really good place to leave our session, actually. I think it's a good place to end there. So I just want to thank all of our participants for their fantastic presentations. Um, and thank you to everyone who has attended today and who's watching later on. Um, thank you again. And that is the, the end of our session. So thank you. Just clap. Thank you.